Here we are finally to talk about Durkheim, the third of the, the major figures who contribute to the development of both sociology and anthropology. So Durkheim uh, was born in 18, 1858 and died in 1917. So you can see that he fits between Marx and Weber, uh, but is closer in, in time to Weber than, than to Marx. Uh, so it's possible that Durkheim knew of Weber's work uh, before he died. He certainly knew of Marx's work and in some places in what we're reading today he responds to Marx's work, albeit without ever mentioning him by name. Now we can think of, of Durkheim in, in one way as trying to figure out how it is that we humans can hang together in societies. It seems counterintuitive in a way that with all with our heterogeneous interests, with our uh, propensity to conflict with one another, that we should be able to form societies at all. And so part of the motivating force behind his work is asking the question, what allows us to form societies in the first place? It seems sort of remarkable to him. So his study of religion is one of the ways that he goes about trying to understand this phenomenon of human society. Uh, he, ha he has other major works that deal with suicide. He was one of the uh, path-breaking uh, writers on suicide as not just an individual uh, phenomenon, but as something that is deeply socially determined. And uh, he developed a sociological method oriented around the study of what he calls social facts. That appears in passing in this piece, but you can also see it underlying the uh, sort of the, the substrate of his work on religion as well. So then, when Durkheim says that he seeks the origins of religion, he's not asking an historical question that is looking for the moment in time when religion first arose. Rather, he's looking for the causes on which religion in its most fundamental elemental form depends. So then we can see right away he views religion as an effect of social life. He'll elaborate on this later to make the claim essentially that social life and religion are inextricable. He thinks then that religion is simultaneously a cosmology, that is a theory of the nature of the universe, or a theory of the nature of nature if you want, and it's a speculation about divine things. So it has this speculative element to it that toward the end he's going to say runs into conflict with science. But first things first, we'll get to that later. As a cosmology then, it contributes not just knowledge but forms of the intellect itself. So what, what does this mean? Well, it means that we develop our basic categories, the categories that we use to orient ourselves to our world, like time, space, class, class not as social class necessarily, but the way that we classify things in the world, number, cause, substance, all of these different things that are part of the cosmology that accompanies religion. They are, as he puts it, the framework of the intelligence. If the framework of our intelligence 
comes from, let me just center that better, comes from our religion, and religion is a social product, then by extension we can see our intellectual framework is also social in nature. This is sort of an interesting claim, right? He's saying that uh, our intellectual frameworks are not something that belong to each of us individually as individuals, as if each of us produces his or her own intellectual framework. Rather, he's saying that they are irreducibly social. Take time as an example. He says that time gets its divisions from social life in things like the recurrence of rights, say the rights that we have uh, associated with harvest, with hunting seasons, with uh, planting, if we're, if we're agricultural uh, types, uh, with feasts, with public ceremonies, that there's a way that we punctuate our lives according to a certain kind of tempo and that this is social in nature. It's not like each of us comes up individually with the notions of time around which we organize our lives, but rather that they're social. We get them from our uh, social life. Now, importantly, uh, he sees religious phenomena as falling into two categories, beliefs and rights. So he, he doesn't think then that religions simply reduce to what people believe, but there's a practical element to them as well. The rights, the rights that we engage in around our beliefs. What distinguishes rights from other actions then is their object. So rights are a kind of practice, but they're not the only kind of practice. There are other sorts of practice as well, right? So. Uh, if we want to become proficient at playing an instrument, uh, the playing of the instrument itself is a practice. The exercises that we use to get better are practice. But rights are a specific kind of practice then. That is, they, um, they orient to particular kinds of object and they express the special nature of the objects to which they orient. So then, what of beliefs? Beliefs, Durkheim thinks, presuppose the classification of real and ideal things into two types. And this is absolutely crucial. This is one of Durkheim's uh, signature distinctions the distinction between the sacred and the profane. Sacredness, significantly, is not an inherent quality of objects. So any object can become a sacred object given the beliefs and rights that a community ascribe to it or practice around it. So it's the beliefs about the object that make it sacred. This, for example, could be one of two types of activities, according to Durkheim. It could be a profane one, in which you're, you're just having wine with dinner, or it could be sacred. Why? Because it is ritual. It is a rite performed with respect to a sacred object. The sacred object in this case being the wine that is, uh, in, in this particular uh, rite, is supposed to be the blood of Jesus, right? So wine in one context and the vessel that carries it is completely uh, profane, mundane, ordinary um, pair of objects, the wine and, and the, the wine glasses. Whereas in the other, the wine in particular, and really the goblet also that carries it, are both sacred objects. There's a certain ritual way of approaching them that you have to undertake in order to partake of them. Similarly with the host, right? The, the host itself, the wafer or the cracker, there's nothing intrinsic 
in that object that makes it sacred. It could be covered uh, with a wedge of cheese made here to look fetchingly like a mouse and just consumed as a, a canapé or something, right? Just a, as, a, again, a completely profane object. So it's not in, it's nothing in the object that makes it sacred or profane. It's the beliefs about the object that give it its sacred quality. Importantly, the definitive feature of the sacred profane distinction for Durkheim is absolute. It's not like they bleed into each other. It's not like there's a fuzzy line that uh, only ambiguously separates the sacred from the profane. No, he says that they are radically opposed to each other as two worlds between which there is nothing in common. Oh, incidentally, so the page numbers that I'm giving you here um, are, uh, there we go, both from my copy of the book so that I know which pages I'm looking at and also the, the um, citations from the copy that you have. So as not to be completely confusing about that. In any case, so two worlds between which there is nothing in common. So what are the defining characteristics of these two exclusionary classes of worlds? Sacred things, he says, are those which the interdictions protect and isolate. So there are interdictions or prohibitions around the object that isolate it. So if you think of going into a cathedral, say, uh, there are parts of the cathedral that the public can go into, but there are parts that are strictly re reserved for the clergy. Right? As, as a lay member of a congregation even, you're not allowed contact with those areas. Why? Because they're sacred and therefore they are isolated off from the profane world in the, in the personage of the laity or the, the congregants. So then this gives us the other side of his distinction. Profane things are those which these interdictions are uh, uh, to which these interdictions are applied and which must remain at a distance from the sacred things. Right, so then the profane by this are um, those things that receive the prohibition, that are not allowed to approach the sacred. So then, their religious beliefs, he says, are representational in nature. But they're also expressive in nature. So they are representations that express the nature of sacred things, the relations they maintain with each other, like between sacred things, and the relations they maintain with profane things, this relation of exclusion and the particular rituals required to allow one to approach the sacred things at, during rituals, ceremonies, um, some festivals, things like that. Rights, then, are rules of conduct prescribing how to comport ourselves in the presence of the sacred thing. So that if, for example, you are the Catholic woman we saw above receiving the host, then I believe she was Catholic let's say she was for the purposes of this, then there's a particular ritual way. There's a posture that you need to take in order to receive the host. Uh, there's a way that you receive it in, into your mouth. Um, there are specific ways that you're supposed to let it rest in your mouth, not chew it, but let it dissolve. All of these things are elements of the ritual that allow you to partake of the sacred object. So I remember um, a, a friend of mine years and years ago told me a story about uh, being, being in a church that was uh, the same denomination 
but uh, is in some other place from where he had grown up. And when he grew up, you were supposed to uh, approach the priest, receive the wafer, and, and he said that you would take it yourself and put it in your mouth. And then he went to this other church, and there, when he reached for it, there was the, the priest sort of recoiled in horror because he's, that, that's not how you do things. That's not the ritual process. The priest is supposed to lay it on your tongue so that uh, you don't handle it yourself. Uh, so the point is not that one or the other is, is the correct or incorrect way. The point is that there is a ritualistic method for approaching, ritualistic form, I should say, for uh, receiving the sacred object. And that when you break from that form, you break the ritual. ritual and, there, and at that moment, you are disqualified from approaching the, the sacred thing. It's only when you do it in the proper ritualistic way that you can approach the sacred thing. In this case, the, uh, the host. Okay, but now we've said all of this about religion, but can't we say the same things about magic? It also has beliefs and rituals. It has myths and dogmas. It, it um, Durkheim doesn't say it in this way, but it uh, gestures to the supernatural in a way that is very similar to the way that, uh, that religions gesture toward the supernatural or in some cases... Uh, fundamentally require access to the supernatural. So then, how to distinguish them? Durkheim points out that religious beliefs are not just received individually by the members of the group, but belong to the group. And that's what gives the group its unity. Religions form congregations around the beliefs that their member that the congregation's members embrace. So he says, a society whose members are united by the fact that they think in the same way in regard to the sacred world and its relations with the profane world, and by the fact that they translate these common ideas into common practices, rites, rituals, is what is called a church. So these things are characteristic of religion. Magic, by contrast, is not organized around a church. It's not congregational in nature. So the magician doesn't share with those who come to consult him or her a moral community. Or they may share a moral community, but it's not on the strength of the magician-client relationship. And this is a further feature. Magicians don't have churches, they have clientels, right? So people who will come to consult them, usually for uh, a fee of some kind, and to uh, receive, um, say, a, a prognosis of what magic is being applied to them in their lives, methods for dealing with that magic, ways of um, directing magic at others, and so forth. So it's a, it's a, a, a relationship of a client, then, rather than a bond within a congregation. Okay, so then Durkheim goes on to say, a religion is a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things, things set apart and forbidden, beliefs and practices which unite into one single moral community called a church, all those who adhere to them. So then we can see that religion is a collective thing because it is inseparable from the church. Right? Again, quality that is not characteristic of magic. Now, Durkheim, uh, again, he's trying to sort of pare religion down to its most fundamental, 
right? And so this is why he starts with totemism. He, he thinks that, that uh, you can have further accretions to religion as time goes on, as a particular society uh, develops its, its religions in different ways, uh, but that totemism is kind of the most fundamental form of religion. So he takes uh, the totem as a way of exploring sacredness. So what makes the totemic object sacred, again, it's not anything intrinsic to that object. Rather, it's the figurative representation the cult gives the object that makes it sacred. So then the totem is above all a symbol, the material expression of something else, the something else being the beliefs of the community. Take a flag, for example. It is a sign distinguishing the clan or a larger community like a nation from others, while also being a visible form of, in a religious context, the God. So because it is simultaneously the symbol of the God of the clan and of the society, the God is nothing other than the clan itself, personified, he says, and represented to the imagination under the visible form of the totem. So the totem is the visible form of the personification and representation of the imagination of the god, which is by extension the imagination of the ideal of the clan. The worshiper then feels held to specific behaviors dictated by the sacred principle with which he communes. Society also gives us the sense of perpetual dependence, pursuing its own ends, which differ from our internal nature. I'll take a brief uh, detour here to talk about social facts, because this is what he's, he's referencing here from his earlier work. So a social fact, he says, is to sociology what a biological fact is to biology, or what a fact about the human mind is to uh, psychology. That is, it's a fact that is social in nature. And because it's social in nature, it's not the creation of each individual within a community, but rather it is the way that the community exercises a kind of force on the individual. So you know a social fact, not when you are in alignment with it, but when you break from it, when you violate its principle. As an example, um, we are expected when we go into a restaurant uh, to have a shirt and shoes, right? You, you see the sign all the time, no shirt, no shoes, no service. When we try to enter without wearing either a shoes or a shirt, the response that we get, we get uh, some kind of sanction exercised against us. It might be laughter and pointing. It might be the manager coming out from behind telling us that we have to leave. There will be some sanction involved. That's how we know that we've broken with a social fact. We violated uh, a principle held by the community. Some of these then will be in law, and that's where we'll, we'll see them most clearly. And so Durkheim writes uh, quite a bit about law as the visible form of social facts. But the fundamental aspects of them are that they're external to the individual and they exercise their force coercively on the individual. Finally, they're spread throughout the community and they are obligatory. So we can't choose whether or not we will comport ourselves in alignment with social facts. 
We do it or we face a sanction. Sometimes those sanctions will be in the form of law. So then this is what he's alluding to when he says that society gives us the sense of perpetual dependence pursuing its own ends, which differ from our individual nature, right? That our own individual nature, our own uh, particular desires and projects might not align perfectly with those of our society. And if we push our own individual projects too much at the expense of the societal projects, that's when we're going to run into the problems with social facts. So it's the same kind of thing that he's talking about here. At one and the same time then, society relies on us and demands our participation in pursuing its goals. So that without the individuals that constitute it, there is no society, of course, but then it demands that we pursue its goals. And, and if we don't, if we decline to pursue its goals, we will face sanctions for that. So then society's hold on, hold on us is less the product of its coercive powers than its moral authority. We obey it mainly because we venerate it. And again, we can see this in the fact that for the most part, we, um, we conform to society's expectations in the way that we dress, in the way that we speak, in the way that we follow the law. So for the most part, we don't feel the, the coercive force. Why? Because we take the moral authority of, in this case, re the religion, because we have a certain veneration for it. So then, again, with respect to the totem, he goes, he goes on to say, we say that an object inspires respect when the representation expressing it in the mind is gifted with such a force that it automatically causes or inhibits actions without regard for any consideration relative to their useful or injurious effects. That is, there's a kind of automatic uh, conformity when we venerate the object. And again, uh, if you want to take the, um, the, the ritual reception of the host as an example, you can see that there's a way that people just automatically follow the ritual requirements to receive the host within any given congregation. There, there's no need to coerce people to receive it in a particular way. It's done automatically. Why? Out of veneration for the host, for the, the sacred object. Durkheim then explains that social pressure feels to us like an external force acting on us, right? Again, when we uh, transgress a, a rule, we feel its social pressure. Even when we haven't transgressed a rule, when we're considering, uh, say, what we're going to wear on a particular day, say we have some kind of a meeting that we need to, need to um, we need, that, that forces us to think carefully about how we want to present ourselves. Well, so we're considering that in the light of the social pressure of our community that feels like an external force. It feels like we're not creating the expectations, that we're receiving the expectations of others. And so we want to align ourselves with respect to those expectations in a particular way. So then, um, as long as we know that we're acted on by society, by the religion in which we participate, but we can't tell by whom or by what, right? Like we, it, with both society and religion uh, or with the sacred, we, we can't simply point to any particular place where the pressure comes from. It's, it's often very hard to locate the force that's exercising itself on us. And so in the religious context, we invent powers 
with which we feel a connection, right? This is the speculative aspect of belief that we, we create or invent the powers that we feel acting on us. But then, this invented force isn't just an authority on whom we depend, so it's not simply a relationship of dependence, it's also a source of our strength, right? It, it can give us uh, a certain feeling of vitality. He says then, the man who has obeyed his God and for this reason believes the God is with him approaches the world with confidence and with the feeling of increased energy, right? There's, uh, so his claim here is that when we feel we have God on our side, we, God or whatever the appropriate equivalent is for the specific religion we're looking at, we feel a certain kind of elevation. We, we feel stronger. We feel righteous, perhaps. But this is not just down to individuals. This force can also manifest itself in groups as what he calls collective effervescence. Now, collective effervescence is not a strictly religious phenomenon. So uh, I, I remember, for example, uh, years ago, I was in Austin for New Year's. And, uh, and so every, there, there was this huge crowd uh, of which we were a part down in front of the city hall there and um or the state building in any case down in the great in the in the large square in front of this government building uh much like times square would be here and um and and people were of course caught up in in the moment they were they were celebrating but they were doing things that they would never do if they were just on their own there is there was uh, an admittedly quite drunk fellow who thought it was really a great idea to, to climb up onto the top of a light pole and hang from, hang from the light standard there. Um, there's this kind of collective effervescence then, right? This feeling of being swept up in a group that is, it's a real experience. And so people will, in groups, feel things, experience things, and do things that they wouldn't do or that are inaccessible to them when they're all on their own. And so this is the kind of force that Durkheim is talking about. His argument is that we continuously get some, as he says, current of energy from without because he, the one receiving the energy, is in moral harmony with his comrades. He has more confidence, courage, and boldness in action. Right? So there's a way then that participating in this congregation, the feeling of having God on your side within a collectivity gives everyone in that collectivity a, a kind of energy. We experience this as external forces that are simultaneously imperious that is, holding a sort of imperial uh, position with respect to us, and helpful, and because they exert on us pressures of which we are aware. We feel these pressures acting on us. We localize them outside of ourselves, right? So we don't feel like we individuals are the creators or initiators of this force. We feel that we individuals are the recipients of this force, whether it's a coercive or energizing force, either way, it feels like something from outside of us being exercised on or through us. He emphasizes that sacred power is just the moral power of social consecration because sacralization, the making sacred of objects, spaces, people, what have you, comes from society. Therefore, it can, he says, 
awaken within its members the idea that outside of them, there exist forces which dominate them and at the same time sustain them. That is to say, in fine, religious forces. So this is the nature of the religious force on us. It feels like it comes from outside of us. Uh, we uh, regard it with a certain kind of reverence or veneration. Uh, it has this sacred quality um, and it is social in nature. The totemic principle then should now be pretty clear. Every religious force comes from outside the object in which it resides, not from whatever impression the object makes on our sense, senses, right? So it's not the, it's not what a physical sensation uh, this book gives me that would make it a sacred object. Say, for example, if it were the Bible and I, and I were Christian, that would be um, the way that it would become sacred, but not through how it feels to me, but rather through the properties that my religious community projects onto it, endows it with. So then he says, religious force is the only sentiment inspired by the group and its members, but projected outside the consciousness that experienced them and objectified. The sacred character is added to the intrinsic properties of an object, right? So it's, it's like something layered on top of the object. You have whatever the physical properties of the object are, they are not what make it sacred. It's what's layered on top that makes it sacred. But this shouldn't really surprise us because it's only by collective representations, right? These representations shared throughout the community a shared symbolism that social life is possible at all. This is what he would call uh, in his other work, the collective conscience or the collective consciousness. It, it's hard to say because he, he writes in French and the word uh, in French, conscience, is either conscient, translated into English, either as conscience or consciousness. Uh, so it's tricky for a translator. You need to make a choice one way or the other. Uh, but you can see that they'll lead to slightly different connotations depending on which you use. Uh, so when he talks about the collective conscience, something like a, um, a moral sensibility that we, that we all share, that's one way of thinking about what he has to say when he says collective consciousness, uh, that has a slightly different valence. It has this idea that we all share uh, some level of consciousness with one another. Uh, so the, anyway, I, I, don't, I don't say that there, one is right and one is wrong, but um, I want to try and, and capture the two trains or the, or, the, or the two lines of translation that you could get from that to get at the idea that in either case, these things are socially determined. They're not simply up to us as individuals. They will have an individual conscience, but we'll also have a social conscience, a collective conscience that we share with our moral community. And that you can think of that when we're talking about this shared symbolism as also something like a shared consciousness. Okay, moving on. So then, just as collective sentiments lie outside each individual within the social body, they can become incarnate in symbols, totems, mythical figures, uh, particular individuals uh, who have a certain kind of sacred presence. That would be, say, a cult leader would, would have that kind of sacred um, ascription given to him or her, almost, almost always him actually, I think. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so, so they're outside the individual and they can become incarnate in symbols. So then Durkheim concludes with the following points. 
it does not follow from the factual existence of religious experience that its reality is what its believers take it to be. Right? So he says that there is a real religious experience. He doesn't deny that. He, he thinks that it's there in virtually all human societies. That doesn't mean, though, that how the individuals who undergo the religious experience uh, are necessarily correct about the reality of what's going on with them or what, what they think that religious experience is. Secondly, then, society is the cause of the sensations that make religious experience. And the moral force it creates ties the believer to the cult or to the congregation. So then this is an important fact, right? Or he would present it as a fact that the sensations, the religious sensations that one experiences are fundamentally social in nature. They come from the society itself. So the, it is the religious expression of the shared consciousness or the collective consciousness or the collective conscience, if you prefer, of the society. Most great social institutions, then, were born in religion. And until an advanced moment of evolution, of social evolution, th this is his thinking. I, I should pause here for a moment. So he thinks that societies evolve um, more or less in a Darwinian way, right? So he's not, he's not a social Darwinist in the sense of saying that some societies and the people within them are objectively better than other societies. But he does think that societies evolve, that the nature of the bonds that hold us together change over time. They are adaptive in that sense to changing circumstances. And uh, so then he has the idea that a society that has gone through uh, a period of evolution, he's using, unfortunately, the term advanced, which really lends itself to this idea of some societies being superior to others. In other, in other work, he categorically rejects this idea, um, but that's not where we're going today. So simply then, um, as a society evolves socially, it's the rules that govern it also evolve and change. Why? Because the rules themselves are a reflection of the changing collective conscience or consciousness. And so therefore, as the society changes, the, the laws and the rules have to change to reflect that. They are expressions of the changing collective consciousness. So then, to get back to his point, he thinks that uh, until quite recently, moral and legal rules have been indistinguishable from ritual prescriptions. That is to say that moral and legal rules until recently within specific societies, he's thinking of European societies, these moral and legal rules have been fundamentally religious in nature, that they've been attached to ritual prescriptions, which is to say they've always been organized around ideas of the sacred. He thinks that uh, in his time, that has changed and that now you have laws that you could say are secular in nature, they're not ritual in nature any longer. That the ritual laws have become confined almost entirely to the, uh, the religious sphere and the secular sphere has become separate and distinct. So then he says, if religion has given birth to all that is essential in society, it is because the idea of society is the soul of religion. What is the implication of this? Well, that all of these institutions that are no longer religious in nature, like say legal institutions that are not legal in nature, can trace their roots back to 
religious origins, that that's where these institutions began, just like the categories that we use began with religion. Um, but that the reason that we can hang on to them, these non-religious institutions that have their origins in religion, is that society is the soul of religion. So that these institutions remain social in nature, but there's a way that they have evolved uh, free of their religious origins. Why? Because they are still social in nature. So that that social nature that produced religion and thereby produced the institutions that religion produced, that social nature persists, albeit in a different form because it's no longer anchored in religion. It has now separated itself from religion. So then the claim that the sacred is something added to and above the real, that religion is society amplified and idealized, is borne out by the fact that evil is also sacred in religion. So uh, if we think of society as constituted by both good and evil, and if we and, and if religion is the idealization, of the society, then it's not just the idealization of all the wonderful things in society. It has that, but it doesn't have just that. It also has all of the idealization of all of the uh, ill in, so in social relations. And so this is why we find that Satan, wh whatever you want to say about the figure of Satan, Satan is a sacred figure. Similarly, in Buddhism, you have the figure of Amara, the evil one, the evildoer, right? So that sacredness doesn't attach or doesn't generate only ideas of goodness, but it also generates ideas like evil. The distinction then is that the real profane world is where life exists and where life passes along. The sacred world, by contrast, exists in thought as a natural product of the social world. The social world, which is lived in on the material plane, produces in the abstract plane of, of thought the sacred world. Durkheim's implication then, the ideal society does not lie outside real society, it is part of real society, just as real society cannot create or recreate itself without simultaneously creating its ideal. Why? Because we're always, as members of a society, considering what the ideal society is or what the good, what the good city would be. Um, in, uh, who is it? Uh, St. Augustine, right? The city of God. So what is the good city? Um, that these are ideals that we, um, that we are continuously producing for ourselves and continuously producing. So then society can't exist, can't continue to perpetuate itself or to reinvent itself without these ideals. Religion then is the expression of a collective ideal. So then just as something uh, essentially, or as something essentially social, religion is not just a translation of material social forms into another language. This is where he's departing from Marx, right? So that his view of Marx is that Marx sees religion as simply a translation of the material substrate of society, the relations of production, into a superstructural form. Something then that's not fundamental about society, but is an expression or um, uh, even a fetish fetishization of social relations in this sort of idealized, abstracted form. So Durkheim does not agree. 
he thinks that uh, religion and the religious ideals are fundamentally social. They're not a translation of anything. They are an expression of, of social ideals. So then all societies feel compelled to sustain their collective ideals and sentiments. Uh, you, you don't need to think about this beyond something like the, the notion of liberty in the U.S. It's such a fundamental idea and ideal that people will go to extraordinary lengths to protect that ideal. Without it, it's hard for, for many, probably most Americans, it's hard to imagine what the idea of America would be without the idea of liberty sewn into it. Right? Uh, and so, again, this idea that, so that would be something like a sacred idea in the US and his point then, all societies feel this compulsion to sustain their collective ideas and sentiments, their moral remaking. This is the basis, the ideal basis on which the society continuously tries to remake itself. And it does this at regular intervals in congregations. So then, the feasts and rites are a system of practices, the demand for and regulation of action. So you can, you can see how this would um, apply within a, a secular realm as well, so that you have things like the uh, ritual of election in, in the U.S. And we've We've seen in this most recent election how extremely seriously people take it. No matter how um, disputational they get about it, it's not that one side takes election seriously and the other doesn't. It's that they that everyone takes it so seriously and as such a, a kind of a, a, a sacred right that people can get extremely, um, well, engaged in collective effervescence, as we've seen. Setting that aside, though, back to religion then. So then, the feasts and rites are a system of practices. The, they are the demand for and regulation of action, right? So the people's actions are uh, constrained and motivated by the requirements of rites, feasts, festivities, celebrations, and so forth. But religion is not just the rites. It's also a system of ideas, ideas that explain the world. They're there to organize and enrich thought. So, Durkheim argues... Religious speculation approaches the same subject matter as philosophy, nature, humanity, and society. Uh, so a different way to put this is that uh, philosophy is a, a different way, say a younger but also a more refined way of taking up the same issues that originated with religion. So its effort to render them intelligible is the same task that science sets itself, right? Science also is in the business of explaining the nature of nature, of explaining reality. It wants to make connections between things, establish internal relations between them, classify them, and systematize them. Right? And so this is why Durkheim thinks that science has its origins in the categories established by religion. Scientific thinking is, in this respect, a more perfect form of religious thought. Applying all the same categories, not doing it in the way that religion does it, but doing it in what he says is a more perfect form 
of the way that religion has done it. But they conflict on a crucial point. So science doesn't begrudge religion its right to exist. Science is not in the business of trying to extinguish religion, even though individual scientists may be, but that's a, that's a separate issue. Science as a practice is not in that business. It does, however, question religion's exclusive claim to know the nature of things. On that front, science says, mm, we do a better job of uncovering the actual nature of things than religion does. So then science will not grant religion the right to dogmatize. It won't recognize religion's claims to a special competence about knowing the nature of reality. It will point out, in fact, that religion doesn't even know itself. And this is part of the work that Durkheim is doing, right? Durkheim is a social scientist. He's trying to establish sociology as a science of the social. And he's saying that through the methods of sociology, we can study and understand religion in a way that religion cannot study and understand itself. So then there, there's a certain kind of uh, intellectual leverage that science can achieve, scientists and, and Durkheim would say, that religion cannot achieve about itself on its own. So then by way of conclusion, where Marx was the progenitor of materialism, or what is uh, in anthropology called political economy, and Weber generated the interpretive approach, the one taken up by Geertz in interpretive anthropology or in symbolic anthropology, Durkheim introduced the functionalist method. So then his view is that we understand social phenomena by the function that they serve within society. So then what is the function of religion? Well, to bind individuals into communities that are coherent and cohesive. This is, he thinks, what religion does. This is the function that religion has within society. Okay, thank you.